All right, noon central, September, COVID, COVID time, um, time period of uh, 2020. Welcome to the uh, My True Genius web webinar. Um, this is the uh, September 2020 webinar presentation, and uh, we'll move on slides here. Um, this webinar is going to be on harassment investigations. We're going to do a one-on-one. So I will just say, you know, at the front end that, you know, this is about harassment investigations in particular. We'll probably touch on some other investigations here and there. The framework uh, that we're going to talk about today is going to be um, applicable for a lot of other investigations. Uh, so again, we're going to be specifically referring to harassment, but I think there's application for a lot of other investigations, um, you know, like discrimination investigations and that sort of thing that that you might, um, you know, need need to do. So a lot of the skills and a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are going to have multiple applications, um, you know, in your in your world in the uh, HR world. So okay, that's the start of that. This is uh, a picture of me. I'm Kevin Mosier. I'm a partner and lawyer up in the Minnesota office for Thompson Co. I'm a certified specialist in labor and employment law, and that is pretty much what I do. And um, this is what I used the sort of clothing that I used to wear before COVID and um, when I used to see clients and other people on a more regular basis. Uh, um, not so much the case anymore, which is probably the situation for you as well. Although, you know, Zoom and, you know, that sort of thing obviously is a, is a deal. If you are um, uh, new to the webinars, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you. If you are, um, if this is, you know, a webinar, you've, you've been to our webinar series. We've been doing this webinar series for eight years. Uh, they are pretty much all recorded, so if anybody ever wants to watch the old webinars, they are available on our website at myhrgenius.co. Not all of them. Um, we only put the most recent, I think, 20 or so on there, but the rest of them are available uh, for members of the My HR Genius program. And this is the My HR Genius program on this slide. If you are unfamiliar with the program, it is a subscription flat fee um, legal service program that starts at $79 a month. Uh, we don't scale based on the size of the company. And um, for that, you get to call us about any of your questions, legal uh, HR questions, and or emails. That's fine, too, and um, includes all the COVID stuff. So we have been inundated. If you have been looking for a resource for COVID legal um, assistance, you know, uh, I think people on the My HR Genius program have gotten more than their money's worth out of out of that if they've been calling in a lot have been um, because it's been a lot of crazy stuff in the last six or so months. Um, this is what you get with the program. You get the hotline, you get these webinars, you get access to the old webinars. Um, we do tips of the week, keeping you apprised. Uh, the tip this week um, that will be going out today probably, uh, maybe tomorrow, but I think it's going to be out today, is, is, on the, is an analysis of the new um, FFCRA. Uh, regulations that just came out this week and were effective as of as of yesterday. So, um, you know, it specifically regards healthcare, uh, the healthcare exception to the FFCRA, but there's also some stuff on intermittent leave as well in these new regulations. But if you are, especially if you're in the healthcare sector, you're going to want to um, understand what these new regulations If you don't understand them already, you really need to understand what the new regulations are. Members of the My HR Genius program, just for example, get access to those, um, to those uh, uh, tips and our analysis on that. Okay. And we do that every week, and so we have hundreds and hundreds. They're also on the website at myhrgenius.co. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about this hour. Um, we are going to we're going to focus on harassment. We're going to go a, a quick overview. I, you know, for those of you that have done other webinars with me, I mean, I've done a lot of harassment webinars over the years, and um, so we're going to we're going to talk about harassment. We're going to give you an underlying understanding of what is harassment that is uh, critical to to understanding what um, 
you know, if we're going to do a harassment investigation, we really need to understand, like, what is harassment, what is not harassment, so that we can make uh, a valuation on what the risk is and what the value of the uh, claim is in, in the event that there's, like, a lawsuit or if it just kind of goes goes haywire. So we need to understand what, what harassment is and what it what is. And we are going to talk about um, – I'm trying to incorporate the word primer – as much as possible um, these days because I've been mispronouncing it on and off for several years. So I'm trying to like use it more so that I say it more correctly. So primer, we're going to talk about the investigations. Um, so we're going to do a primer on that. Uh, and we're going to talk about triggering, like where, like what's the intake? How do we um, get charges? What does that mean? Should we have a, a system in place? A framework in place for intake of charges and then what's the next phase well we talk about gathering we're going to talk about analysis of the information that we gather and then we're going to talk about making the ultimate determination on what to do with the information based on our policies and all that um, and along the way there will be a bunch of tips uh, that will hopefully be very helpful for you and I think we'll use up our you know 55 or 60 minutes or so uh, on this um, without without question. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, and, and I think you probably saw something when you registered, but if you uh, need CLE credits um, uh, for, I think, Texas and Minnesota, or if you need HRCI or SHRM credits, we have credits there. These, this presentation has been um, approved for those. So if you don't get your your certification and you wanted to, um, just let us know. Otherwise, we we send them out in the next day or two uh, to everybody who indicated that they needed that they needed credits uh, upon registration. We have to check to make sure everybody actually attended before we can send out the red, the certifications, the certificates to people. Um, you know, don't don't blame us. It's uh, it's something. It's something that. Um, we uh, have to do for Sherman HRCI and, and the CLEs. Okay, um, so let's talk about let's talk about harassment. There are two types of harassment, and one one thing I always mention. I yeah, I did say it on this on this slide. One thing I always mention is that harassment is really just a form of discrimination. So if you think about it as a as a form of discrimination, that um, that might be that might be helpful to you, um, but it, it is helpful for me when I just think of harassment, it's just like a flavor of discrimination, right? So there are two types of, of harassment. There's quid pro quo and there's hostile work environment. Quid pro quo is pretty easy to understand. Quid pro quo is, uh, I think, Latin for this or that. Um, and what that means is, so we've got um, Ron Burgundy here uh, leering at um, Veronica Page? No, not Veronica Page. Veronica? Uh, I can't. Well, I think I think her name's Veronica. Um, it's one of my favorite movies, but I pretty sure Vanessa Veronica. It's one of those two. Um, so, quid pro quo is this: if you are a supervisor or even just a coworker, and if you say, in return for some sort of sexual whatever, uh, I will give you a promotion, I will give you a job, I will give you a raise, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to give you something, it, so it's an exchange, it's a transaction, um, but it's a transaction that's based on uh, an unequal power, right? So, so if um, if a manager were ever to premise or uh, make required that the person does, you know, goes on dates or does whatever sexually with with them, uh, and in return they will get favorable employee treatment of some sort. Then that's quid pro quo harassment. It's the abuse of it's the abuse of the power differential that two people in the workplace have. The classic example now is is the Harvey Weinstein stuff, um, and we've been talking about that for years now. But it's still just like a perfect example. Harvey Weinstein being the big you know Hollywood movie producer, saying um, you come and give me uh, you know uh, a risque back massage young actress and I will make you a star in one of my movies, right? Could, could for a call. He's abusing his power. He's, he's allowing um, for the transaction. Hostile work environment is more nuanced. Quid pro quo is pretty easy to figure out. I mean, if you do an investigation and you get your information and you're like, okay, quid pro quo, like that's, 
um, you know, okay, she had to do this, uh, and in return she got this. Okay, that's that's going to be pretty easy to do the analysis and figure that one out. I think most people get that. Hostile work environment's harder, and the reason is, and we'll talk about the elements of a hostile work environment on the next slide, but the reason hostile work environment is harder is because um, it is uh, objective and sub it has to be objectively hostile and um, subjectively hostile. And the workplace has to be like severe and pervasive hostility. So, you know, what is hostile to one person might not be hostile to another person. Um, slights, nuances, uh, bad joke, you know, uh, distasteful jokes, pinups, pictures, weird texts. You know, some people might be bothered by it. Other people might not be bothered by it. And that's what makes hustle work environment very difficult to, to figure out. And most of our, um, most of our uh, investigations kind of revolve around hustle work environment claims, trying to suss out what, you know, what is really going on here and whether or not the activity of the person or people violated ultimately your, your policies. With regard to unlawful harassment, and again, I'm going to differentiate between unlawful harassment and harassment. Um, I get that, you know, there is a difference, right? So unlawful harassment is a much higher bar. Again, we'll see on the next slide what it takes to be unlawfully, like for an actual event of unlawful harassment, it's going to be a much higher bar. You could say just generally like I'm being harassed, right? Because a lot of people subjectively think they're being harassed all the time at restaurants, at gas stations, just walking down the street. And maybe they are objectively, um, but, but a lot of people, a lot more people subjectively uh, think that they're being harassed. And it's not to say that they're wrong or that's a bad thing. I'm, I'm not, that's not my in, intent. But it is to say that just because somebody subjectively thinks that they're being harassed that doesn't mean that a company has any actual liability. Um, I, you know, have never seen a study on this, but just anecdotally talking to a lot of HR people, it seems like a lot of workplace, quote, harassment claims are really just employees not being happy with a coworker or a manager. Uh, I've seen dozens and dozens of, quote, harassment claims um, really about a supervisor, really just kind of coming down to the fact that they don't like to be supervised. Um, I have no doubt that my 16-year-old son would say that I'm harassing him all the time when I'm asking him to, to do chores, you know, to, uh, like yesterday, shut the cabinets, um, you know, clean his dishes, that sort of thing. I am sure he sees that as harassment. Uh, I just see that as uh, parental management, right? Um, and, you know, so translate that to the workplace, a lot of employees think that they're being harassed by their supervisors when really the supervisor is just managing them. Um, and we have to really, and, and that's why we do the investigation sometimes to figure out like, where is the line? What is it? Is it just management that you find distasteful? Is it supervision you find distasteful uh, and you are calling harassment or is it something you know, more, um, more based on sex and something, you know, uh, let's just say creepier, I guess, um, is what I would say, uh, that, that sort of thing. And the creepier stuff is what we have to figure out because the creepier stuff is where we, where we have liability. Now there's two ways for companies to have liability in harassment claims. And the first one is if a supervisor commits a harassment, then supervisors are, are agents of the company. And so there's, they're going to be directly liable. You're, the, you, are, you as a company are going to be directly liable for the actions of your supervisor. So if a supervisor causes the harassment, quid pro quo or hostile work environment, doesn't matter, then you're going to have a direct liability on that. If it's a coworker, then you're only, as a company, only going to have liability if you knew or should have known about it, right? So if two coworkers go out for a date and things go badly on like a Friday night and it's off work and you don't know anything about it and there's no like lead up to it, but things go bad and Monday morning comes and the uh, employee says, hey, things got, got weird and, um, you know, she 
touched me inappropriately and that sort of thing. It's like, um, okay, well, that's, you know, good. We, we can take care of that. But if the employee, this, I guess a guy in my situation here, if he never says anything about it, and if he then just like gets fired like a month later or six months later, uh, or he quits and he claims harassment because of this Friday night thing with his female coworker, well, in that situation, we really we would just say as a company, like we really don't know, like how did we know you never complained about it? So we don't have any real liability. Um, so again, that's the sort of thing that we need to figure out um, through the investigation. So again, let's go to the legal definition of a hostile work environment because again, this is the legal definition. This is what imputes liability on the company. Now, I will say most companies, especially post Me Too, most companies lower, like, like they will act on harassment that's much lower than the legal than the legal standard, right? Like I would not. I, I think for most companies, you don't you don't want to say like, oh, okay, like is this going to be. You know, he touched her, but did he, he touched her on the shoulder as opposed to sexual body, you know, a sexual area. So, you know, given that Eighth Circuit case where it's okay to kind of, like nobody wants to, like that's not what HR normally does, right? Um, you see this sort of thing, here we go, guy, you know, touching a uh, coworker, that's it. And by the way, if you ever t type in sexual harassment, and and on, into Google, and you look at all the images, the number of consulting companies that probably took these sort of canned workplace pictures where the guy puts the shoulder, the hand on the shoulder, and she looks. I there were easily fifty of these, uh, fifty of these pictures on the internet. So it, this must be a very, you know, I think everybody understands like this is like your one of your very typical scenarios, right? Guy leans over puts his hand around her it uh it's an ex it's an illustration of control uh it's also sexual in nature uh he's he's leaning in a little bit too close close to her it's you know ubiquitous right so um so but whereas this sort of touch right here is in and of itself if this is just the only thing there's you know don't i can't make promises but this is normally not unlawful sexual harassment. A one-off like this, not going to be unlawful sexual harassment. That being said, you as a company don't want to put up with it more likely than not, right? So you don't have to figure out like, okay, is this legal or not legal? You probably are just going to like have a much lower bar for what is harassment in violation of your policy. But for the legal definition, here's the legal definition, offensive conduct, it has to be objectively and subjectively offensive. But the objective, the objectively offensive, uh, abusive, or hostile behavior, that's the, that's the rub, right? That's where it has to be objective to a reasonable person. And so if, um, you know, that's a much uh, different standard. Uh, it also has to be severe and pervasive. That is, that's why this one-off touch on the shoulder right here, probably not hostile work environment doesn't create a hostile work environment if it's just a one-off because it's not severe it's not pervasive if he touched her breast in this picture i would say that that would be severe and that would probably be enough to um to legally uh you know trigger um uh, an unlawful hostile work environment right because obviously those are just different things shoulder breast different things um and then it also has to have uh, affect the term or condition of somebody's somebody's employment. And then again, we're just talking about um, sexual harassment here in this webinar, but harassment as a general, um, as a general rule, it includes all forms of, uh, that are protected by law, by law. So under title seven, so race um, and uh, you know, the other, there's like 12 of them, right? So just, you know, race, for example, is, is another one. So Harassment is unlawful if it's based on, you know, sex, gender, race, um, and all the other um, Title VII covered, covered protected statuses. I always like to include this Star Trek picture. <laughs> so um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for bearing with me as I uh, include my, my Spock harassment picture. Um, so what is not harassment? And again, this is not 
it's generally not legal, like unlawful harassment. This does not, I'm not implying that you need to put up with this stuff at the workplace. But from a legal standpoint, petty slights, bullying, annoyances, isolated incidents like that shoulder touching, um, non-sexual touching, those are generally not considered harass, like unlawful harassment. Now, you still look at the severe, the pervasiveness. If you've got non-sexual touching like daily or several times a week, you know, the guy goes and puts his hand over her shoulder and touches her. And if that happens several times and it it have over a short period. Okay, it's like then we'll start to talk about the uh, pervasiveness of it. And in that situation, it might get up to the level of unlawful har- harassment. But just kind of isolated incidents, petty flights, that sort of, they're generally not um, unlawful harassment. More likely to be harassment is sexual touching, name calling, intimidation, slurs, offensive jokes, offensive picture stalking. And again, I just put this all like when I think about it, it's just easier for me to think about is the is what the person is doing is it creepy? And if it's creepy, I they I think the court should start to adopt that as the definition like. But again, that's creepy is is kind of subjective, right? But I think there's an objectiveness to to creepy as well. Um and there certainly could be. So I would just say like this, if it triggers, if it hits your radar as being creepy, um, then you want, you want to put a stop to it and, and hopefully you don't get sued and, and all that. But if it's, if it seems inappropriate, if it seems creepy, you as a company probably want to say like, that's, that's enough. I just want to mention really quickly bullying versus unlawful harassment, because a lot of employees just like with my example where, where employees are talking about um, supervisors, quote, harassing them, they also often talk about supervisors, quote, bullying them. And again, just like my 16-year-old probably thinks that I'm harassing or bullying him when I tell him to, like, you know, do his chores or pick up after himself, um, bullying is not the same as harassment. Again, unlawful harassment has that very specific de- definition that we just talked about, severe, pervasive, objective and subjective, uh, hostile, abusive conduct um, that affects the term or condition of employment. Bullying behavior is probably not that. Now, if bullying behavior has a sexual um, or a racial or whatever undertone to it, then it might be harassment. But bullying in and of itself is not unlawful. Um, harassment is can be unlawful, but not, again, like I've been saying, not all type of, quote, harassment, as people talk about, is unlawful. Same with bullying. Bullying, so if you hear, if you hear in your investigation uh, from the employee that, you know, so-and-so is mean, they're aggressive, they're rude, they're disrespectful, they're offensive, obviously we need to dig into that and figure out, like, what specifically, uh, how are they specifically aggressive? Do they touch you? How are they offensive? Did they, again, did they touch you? Did they say something racist? Did they say something sexist? What, what is it that we have to understand? But just generally disrespectful, offensive, ruby, like just in and of itself, if the person's just kind of a jerk, that doesn't mean that that's very likely not going to be unlawful harassment. So we have to kind of uh, understand if this is a bullying or um, an unlawful harassment situation. And again, like I said before, just because it's bullying and just because it, it probably isn't unlawful that puts your company or organization at risk of legal liability, that certainly doesn't mean that you want to put up with it. I mean, it can, you know, for, it can have serious detrimental impacts on your, on your workplace environment and all that. So we still need to address bullying but I just want to tell you, like, there is no law that says bullying is illegal. Um, bullying is unlawful in the workplace. People can, I guess, be jerks. They can be bullies. If you're a jerk, and I always say this, so, you know, and I'm, you know, apologies to people who have been listening to me for years and years, but, um, you know, I'm a uh, green and gold Packer fan, which is great to say this week because they just, like, trounce the Vikings, right? So, um so if I were to come in the office, which, you know, I could probably do this, um, come into the office, and then I start uh, going around the office, 
and making fun of the Vikings fans because the Vikings, you know, looked terrible last weekend in the football game. And I'm just like talking all, all uh, about the, how awesome the Packers are. Um, even though that's all true, that still like people probably could be perceiving me as being a jerk, right? And by bullying them and being mean and being aggressive and being rude and disrespectful and maybe even offensive if I'm just talking about how awesome the Packers are. So um, all true, right? That might be bullying. Doesn't mean any of it's unlawful, right? Because it's not about a protected class. Now, if I'm bullying somebody and I'm really picking on them because of their race or because of their gender, yeah, maybe the bullying trends, maybe it's, it's enough to be harassment, unlawful harassment. But if I'm just talking about something that has nothing to do with a protected class, like, you know, football, um, then, then it's just not going to be unlawful. Okay. Let's primer, investigation primer. Okay. So far, so good on remembering how to say that word. Okay. So why do we want to do investigations? Um, here's why we want it done. When, you know, for the most part, we are, this is an age where I, you know, I, every employer is different, right? But this is, for the most part, an age where employers are waking up to the idea that they should try to be a little bit nicer to employees. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing, but more importantly, right, from uh, an economic standpoint, um, it uh, reduces costs of, of recruiting, having to constantly recruit people, and it's nice to have good morale and good culture because people are generally more, more productive, right? I, again, there's your economic argument for it. Um, we want, but also um, with regard to harassment, there is legal risk there. There's legal exposure there um, and liability. So we want to do what we can to create an environment and support an environment that is, um, you know, not harassing and that that keeps people in their in their jobs and happy and productive and all that sort of thing. So as a company, we do lots of things, right? We do lots of things for employees to make them happy and to like us and to not want to leave if they're a good employee. So we do lots of things uh, uh, surrounding that. And one of the things we sometimes have to do is we sometimes have to do investigations because then we have to police, right? So HR, we, in HR, we create the policies, we lay the foundation, we lay the, uh, the foundation for understanding and having a great environment. But then, um, then we're called on when there are complaints and stuff, then we're called on to actually police it as well, right? So it's kind of cool because we, you know, in HR, we get to write these things, we get to create the, create the policies and all that, but then we get to enforce them as well, right? Um, so, and there are lots of objectives that we, that we have. These are the primary ones that I've, I've included. So, so we want to have a plan, right? So again, we want to lay the foundation. We want to have policies that prevent harassment. If you do not have an anti-harassment, anti-discrimination policy in your handbook or a policy that's been distributed to employees, that is something you need to do like a long time ago. So do it, do it as quickly as possible. Your policy has to have a reporting mechanism, and that reporting mechanism needs to include multiple layers. And the reason it needs to include multiple layers is because let's just say the reporting mechanism says go to your supervisor with any complaints of harassment and your supervisor is the person that's harassing you. And then the, the employee sues the company and says there was no legitimate way for me to report the harassment because the harasser was the person I'm supposed to report it to. Um, I think most companies have gotten this memo, but it's worth just double checking your policy to make sure that it um, it includes multiple levels of reporting. Okay, so our plan, we're going to have policies. We are going to, and then when there's a complaint, we are going to investigate and ensure compliance. That's basically what we're doing with an investigation, right? We're just ensuring compliance. We're, we're policing our policies. And then we're going to mitigate or eliminate risks uh, by, you know, somehow making taking action based on our the complaint and our and our investigation that's what i call mitigating risks okay so part one here we go we're going to get into the primer uh more nuts and bolts of our primer here 
And um, next month, maybe I'll have another word. Maybe next month I'll have a different word, and that will be a really cool word. Um, and it won't be primer because I don't. I think I'm. I think I've got it now. So, uh, okay. So part one, we're going to do intake and initial initial evaluation. So, what do we do? I think this is probably the easiest one, right? Um, but again, we're going to have to have a policy. We've got to have reporting in our policy. And let's just say somehow it eventually gets to supervisor, it gets to HR, so we do intake. Um, the first thing we need to do, uh, beside like, you know, dust off your, your um, you know, inspector hat, uh, if you have an inspector hat, I'm assuming you might have an HR inspector hat, maybe a little HR badge or something like that that says inspector on it, I would get something like that. I think that would be really cool. Um, I'd like to wear that when I interview people. Um, instead of like a suit and tie, so I think that would be that would be cooler. So we're gonna get we're gonna get um, we're gonna get the initial complaint. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is you want to get a narrative from the employee, and I'm not and I'm gonna say something and it's going to sound adverse to employees, and it is kind of adverse. To, so you sort of it is adverse to employees, right? And I'm not saying employees don't have legitimate a legitimate basis for making complaints and har harassment is not a problem in the workplace. Like I totally understand it, in a lot of workplaces, harassment is a problem. Um, and it's, you know, just because Me Too happened doesn't mean that we have rooted out harassment in the workplace. Like I think that's going to take a lot longer, uh, you know, to, to figure out. Um, but we want to lock the employee. This is the lawyer in me um, telling you, we want to lock the employer into a narrative. And the reason we want to do that is because sometimes employees' stories change. And we want to have something in writing from them that's dated, that's signed by them. So you could do an intake form. You could just tell them to send you an email, whatever it is. But you want something from the complaining employee De giving you as much detail as possible. Now you're still going to interview them, as, you know, in part uh, two here coming up, but but we want to lock them into a narrative. I don't think anybody's going to be surprised when I tell you that I have seen stories change when lawyers get involved. So if the employee, you know, complains and they complain of A, B, and C to you today. We want to lock them in and they say, okay, this has been going on for like months. Uh, the, you know, A has occurred, B has occurred, and C has occurred. And you, you know, go and resolve and whatever happens. But whatever happens, eventually the employee sues you and they get a lawyer. And suddenly it's not A, B, and C. It's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, right? And because – because lawyers have to do something, and that's what their jobs are, to try to make give their you know plaintiff, former employee clients um, a better shake at at a lawsuit, and so they're likely to dive deeper into things. They're likely to maybe make up some stuff, um, you know, not accusing anybody, but uh, I suspect that happens, and. So we want to, what we want to do is we want, first of all, we, we want to understand the, the full scope of the allegations, right? We, we need to understand that. If we're just going to do an investigation, um, if you're pro-employee or anti-employee, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. We want to understand the, the scope of the investigation. We want to understand the details of, the, of what we're trying to do here. So we've got to get that from the employee. Getting that in writing is a really good idea. From a legal standpoint, we want to lock them into a narrative. Because if the, an, an attorney later says, like, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, then, then we will go back and we'll show, show the court that no, 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 before the lawyer got involved, it was really just A, B, and C. Like, that's what we knew about. That's what was on the mind of the employee. This other stuff seems to have been manufactured after the fact. Okay? So get it in writing. Get a full narrative from the, from the employee. And we have to understand... Um, again, we're going to understand the scope. We're going to understand the the nature um, of the type of harassment that we're dealing with because that might change the way that we in, that we investigate things. We also want to understand from the initial intake, and um, we want to understand from the initial intake how serious is this? Is this 
is this something that's been like ongoing for a long time? Is it something that, again, we're, we're, we still have to figure out the legitimacy of the allegations, but is it, is it sexual touching? Is it really bad or racist uh, banter uh, or, you know, offensive conduct? Even if it ultimately proves to be untrue, we, at the initial outset, if the complaint is really bad, if it makes the hair on your skin stand up, and if it's super creepy, and if, if it were to continue at all um, while you're investigating, it would put serious liability and maybe somebody would even get harmed, like injured, if that's the case, if it's even on the horizon, you need to, you're going to need to take action and, and likely suspend the person who's being accused. And I'm not saying there's any justice in that, but, because the, but, what you, but that's, that's how you do it. You suspend the person who's accused pending the outcome of the investigation. And I always like to say with or without pay pending the outcome of the investigation, which is to say, like, we're not going to pay you for this, like, next week or two um, to sit at home and eat Cheetos, um, you know, when we ultimately decide that you've harassed a coworker or a subordinate employee. Like, you know, it might be your last day of pay uh, or might not. Or if, or if ultimately we, we bring you back, we'll, we'll pay you for it. And you could let people use PTO or not, um, kind of up to you. So, okay, so we're going to analyze the complaint. We're going to assess the seriousness. We're going to take some actions based on the seriousness. If it's not serious at all, I don't think you need to send the person home. But, but if there's any potential risk to injury or if the person's going to interfere with the investigation at all, we are going to um, have to get rid of them, um, which is actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that's actually part of the preparation, right? So, okay, here's another one of your 50 uh, hand-on-the-shoulder shoulder pictures. Um, the woman always looks very, very concerned. I mean, she is definitely not like subjectively, although this woman right here, she looks kind of puzzled, like almost laughing. I don't, I don't think she's, I don't think that's the intent here, but she almost looks like puzzled, concerned about the whole, the whole thing. I don't think that's really a smile, but anyway, uh, like 50 of these pictures, I swear they're, they're, very typical for these uh, agencies to, to make these pictures. Okay, so preparation. So before we move on to, before we go into um, gathering facts, we are going to, we're going to consider, uh, so I jumped the, uh, the gun a little bit. So in part two, we are going to consider the nature of the allegations, and we are going to consider whether or not we can do a legitimate investigation into the allegations without, with, with the accused being around, I normally, unless it's really, you know, if it's a serious allegation of harassment, I think it's just best to get the person out of the picture. You don't, it's going to be hard for them to work. They're going to have a hard time concentrating. They're going to be upset, of course, because, you know, they're, they're being, uh, a, a, even though it's just an accusal, you're, they're probably going to feel like you're, judging them already by sending them home. But the reality is it's just really hard to do an investigation with somebody around, especially if they're a supervisor or a manager. Um, and, and it's just easier from a liability standpoint. You don't have to worry about them retaliating. You don't have to worry about them continuing the harassment. And it's just easier to get rid of them. So I, I'd send them home. Um, don't send the accuser home. Um, that's not a good idea. That does seem like it's potential retaliation. Now, if the accuser doesn't feel comfortable and wants to be at home and wants to be sidelined during the investigation, that's fine. But I, I would not generally, it, it could be seen as an, a move of retaliation to um, uh, suspend basically or you know, send home the person who is accusing. You might have to make uh, uh, some sort of communication from, um, to the team you know, about what's going on, but you don't want to be, you don't want to give details about a harassment investigation. You just want to say people are on leave of absence. Um, more information will be forthcoming. Do the best you can. Sometimes it's hard in those, in those situations. Um, and then determine your investigation team. You might be able, you know, an HR person might be just fine to do the investigation. You might want to have a, a manager as well. If it's a manager level person, you might want to have their supervisor 
uh, in, in on it. Generally, I recommend having two people in on an investigation, uh, HR, two people from HR or an HR person and somebody in management. If it's really serious, you're going to want to bring an outside investigator in, whether it's an a, attorney or um, an HR consultant who does this sort of thing professionally. You're going to want to bring them in to do it. Um, there's a lot of political reasons for for doing that, and um, so you know that that can be a really good thing. With a lot of these investigations, though, I mean most most complaints are pretty milk toast, right? They're pretty minor. They don't you don't need to bring an attorney in. I mean, I'm happy to do investigations. I like doing them, but but I you know I don't need to be brought in on every little complaint that's. Uh, that's made right. Um, HR people, especially after this webinar, should be in pretty good shape to to do most investigations unless they're pretty sensitive from a legal a legal standpoint. And then you're going to outline the plan for gathering facts. What is your plan? Um, you're going to do some interviews. You're going to do some um, document gathering. Maybe you're going to need to have you know again this is all going to drive off of what the allegations are. Uh, maybe you're going to need to engage IT or a third-party IT company to come in and check emails. Maybe um, maybe you're going to have to uh, talk to some vendors. But you're going to want to outline your uh, your flow of how you're going to do the investigation. There you go. That's all the preparation. Now we're going to get into my favorite pictures of my favorite um, uh, private investigators, detectives um, of all time. Okay, that's Sherlock Holmes, by the way. Uh, so we are now going to gather facts. So gathering facts is kind of like just what it what it says, right? And the way we gather facts and what we do is again all driven off of what the allegations uh, are. But we're going to gather gather facts. And you know, your investigation, if it's really minor, it might be just talk to one person. It, this might be talk to two people, ask them for a statement. It could be pretty minor if it's. If it's a pretty big time uh, allegation against like a vice president and a bunch of, you know, let's just say women are involved. Okay, I mean, if it's a Harvey Weinstein thing, yeah, you're going to need like law firms and a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of people to come in and do this. But a lot of investigations, you're just going to gather facts. It might be just getting some texts, some IMs that were that were traded. Uh, it might be talking to one or two people. It's going to all depend on the nature of the complaint and all that. So we got We have to review that. Um, we're going to do investigations. We'll talk about some interview tips in a minute. We're probably going to we're probably going to in interview all the witnesses. If a witness, um, if a witness says, "Oh yeah, so and so also," so if you talk to the complaint, so the first person you're going to talk to, um, always in an investigation, you're going to get their narrative. And then you're going to, and then you're going to have the first interview with the complaining and the accuser. The first, the first is is with the accuser, and <clears throat> excuse me. Then you're going to talk to all the witnesses. So this is your plan, right? So then you're going to talk to all the witnesses. Did anybody witness so and so touching you, uh, putting your, his hand on your shoulder? Did anybody witness, um, you know, all this other behavior? Yes. Okay. Um, Dave witnessed it. Great. I'm going to talk to Dave. Uh, anybody else? Get all the names possible, and then you just basically spread out and you interview them. Then you go and interview Dave. Dave, what do you know about the interactions between uh, employee A and employee B? Um, have you ever seen anything that that you didn't like? Open-ended questions. We'll talk about interview tips in a minute, but open-ended questions on this. Um, so that we can try to get Dave in this situation to give us the information as opposed to us feeding him information. Now, with any interview of the of an employee, you're going to you cannot promise confidentiality, and it's the same when an employee is making a complaint of harassment. They might very well come to HR or come to a supervisor and say, "Hey, you know, this is just between us, but." So and so touched me. I didn't really like it. So and so keeps asking me out, and I and I I've told him no every time, and he just won't let up. Don't do anything about it. Don't say anything about it. Like that. That last part, you can ignore because once you're HR, you're always HR. Once you're a manager, you what you know is what the company knows. Same with HR. So you can't just like shove it under the rug. You have to pursue it. 
And you could just tell the employee, like, I'm sorry, but now that you told me, I have to pursue this. I have to follow up on it. I know, so I can't, I can't let it slide. So we're going to, and it's the same with, with employees. So we're going to talk to the employees. We'll talk to Dave, and Dave might say, well, I don't really want to say anything about it. Say, sorry, Dave, you're an employee of this company. It's required that you participate in this investigation. I need you to answer these questions. And Dave has to answer those questions. Otherwise, you could take disciplinary action against Dave for not being helpful with your investigation. Interviews. Okay, so ideally, I always recommend having two people, one person who asks the questions and another person who takes notes. Now, if both of you want to ask questions, that's totally fine. But I think it makes sense for one person to really concentrate on the behavior of the witness, uh, their nonverbal cues, and then listen to like what they're saying without having to worry about writing down notes. So ideally, two people are interviewing at least the key, the, the key people. Um, you want to write out in advance, so I guess it's kind of part of your plan, but you want to write out in advance a statement that you read to the employee. And it talks about the confidentiality. I cannot promise confidentiality. Everything that you say, this is not an attorney relationship. Everything that you say um, will, you know, is going to be used in our investigation. Um, you know, if you, whatever. So you write out a statement that you read to every employee um, that you're, every person that you're going to interview. Um, you want to not, uh, uh, you want to keep the employees fo focused, right? So keep them focused on what you're trying to get from them and not, uh, and not allow for a bunch of gossip. Try to ask open-ended questions without feeding the employee the situation as you know it. And without without trying to like tell them what you're trying to trying to hear, and that's just kind of an art, and it just kind of takes time and practice to um, to work on that. But again, asking opening questions, like like I mentioned before, Dave, did you did you ever see anything that you found uh, offensive with you know between employee A and employee B? Okay, you did. Tell me about it, right? Um, Dave, in 2019, did anything, did so-and-so ever talk to you about uh, behavior that their, you know, that this other coworker was engaging in? Okay, tell me about it. Um, and you just might have to keep asking multiple questions to try to get at the, did Dave actually witness the hand on the shoulder? Um, and if so, what did he think about it? Did the employee talk about it? And so you want to ask, you want to figure out all this. To, at the end of the day, understand ultimately did your did your policy get violated? Okay, one of my favorite quotes: "There's a time to laugh and a time not to laugh," and this is not one of them. Um, so I really love like the Pink Panther movies. Uh, things not to do during the during the interview: no jokes. You know, we don't want to take light. This is very serious. I mean, people have complained. Um, you're more likely to have tears uh, in an interview than you are to have jokes, I would, I would say. Um, don't appear to be biased. Don't make promises. Don't misrepre misrepresent the company's policy or position. Um, you know, a lot of times the people who you're interviewing, they want to get, they want to understand. They want to know, like, are, you know, are they going to be judged? They want to know, like, why they were named. Um, maybe they've already taught, you know, maybe they've already heard the grapevine what's going on. But they, a lot of times employees are going to interview you as much um, as, as uh, you're going to be interviewing them. And, and again, it's an art, but you need to try to not provide them with information. It's not the whole process, purpose of the interview is not to put them at ease. It is to uh, get the information that you need to pursue the allegations that have, that have been made. Um, one person just asked if uh, you asked the accuser, how would you like to see this resolved? That's, a, that's definitely a fair thing to ask, and I would ask that at the front end during the interview, like how would you like to see this resolved? Um, it just gets an idea, it gives you an idea of the framework of how serious this needs, uh, potentially how serious, but I will say that ultimately it doesn't matter. Um, ultimately how the accuser wants to see this resolved 
um, is really immaterial to your ultimate decision um, because, you know, the accusers, you know, they might say, I don't want to see the person lose their job, but you might find through the investigation it was like sexual touching and maybe you find out that it's not the first time and, you know, you as a, you don't want, you're not going to want somebody who's walking around touching uh, people inappropriately, right? I mean, that's that's just walking beside the fact that it's probably not good for morale and everything. It's it's also walking legal liability. Like best to get rid of that that person if they're if they're going to put your company at at risk. So I, I would get rid of them. I whatever the even if the accused says, well, I don't want you know they're a family person. I don't want to see them lose their job. Um, you know, then I wouldn't I wouldn't bother it. Um, <laughs> And then the question on the inbox is: We had the accuser ask for money for pain and suffering. That that is um, <laughs> uh, that is somebody who either looked up some stuff on the internet or or had an attorney feeding them information. Uh, I I would not. I mean, the the idea of doing an investigation is to is to put um, the end to your to your risk of exposure, especially if it's a. Um, if it's a coworker situation, if it's a coworker harassment and the and you're doing the investigation and you're going to put a stop to it, that you're basically extinguishing your potential for legal liability. And so I, I certainly wouldn't give any employee any any money because really you've you've put a put a cork in the potential for legal liability once you do the investigation and and um, you know put a stop to it. If it's coworker harassment, if it's supervisor harassment. Then there still might be some potential for legal legal liability, and you know if you want to do a severance agreement or something like that, waiver and release agreement, um, you know it's something to consider. But I would I would be suspect uh, I would be suspicious if I got that response from an employee that they wanted money. Um, okay, so we're going to analyze the information. So we've got two more parts to this. Um, we're going to analyze the information. So we're going to look at all the we're going to look at all the notes. From the interviews, we're going to look at the documents, the IMs, all the all the things that we've gathered, and we are going to make a credibility assessment. Um, somebody earlier asked at the beginning of the webinar asked um, wrote in the Q and A that it's a he said she said right with no witnesses. That's most sexual excuse me sexual harassment um, investigations, right? The it's almost. I mean, most of the time, it's he said, she said. That's why we do the investigation. That's why we talk to as many people as we can. Ultimately, you get to be the judge. And as, from a legal standpoint, as long as you make an informed, non-discriminatory-based decision, then you're protected from, legal, from a legal standpoint. You could be totally wrong. Right, um, you could be completely wrong. You might have gotten it 100% wrong. The employee, if it's a touching situation, let's just say it's a, a groping situation, nobody was a witness, and you you believed the accuser, and you believed that that she was credible, and based on the interviews, you interviewed the accuser, you interviewed the accused. Um, oh, and by the way, I forgot to say, I I always interview the accused at the end. Um, and then you might have to circle back and interview the accuser again, and, and that you might have to you know, like rinse repeat on the interviews. But I always do the the accuser, the accused at the end, so that you have as much information as possible when you go in to talk to them, so that you can use that information to try to really um, get them to respond to to it. And it's just better to have all that knowledge when you talk to the accused. Um, so, again, it doesn't matter if you're wrong as long as you are are um, sincerely wrong. So if you believe, you know, he said, she said, and you believed that she was groped at work by a supervisor and you fire the supervisor, and then a year later she goes on Facebook and says, you know, I got that terrible supervisor who wouldn't give me a raise, I got him – uh, kicked out of his job by just making up a story for HR. It's like, okay, HR, you just, you know, we learned a lesson. But the accused, the guy who lost his job, he doesn't have any recourse against you. 
um, because you were you made an informed decision. It's it, and it can go it goes both ways. So this is a situation where you get to play uh, judge and jury on it, and, and as long as you base it on the information that you got um, through through a legitimate uh, investigation, following all these procedures, then you should be in in um, in, in you know legally protected in that decision might not make people happy. Um, and they might, you know, obviously you're not going to make everybody happy here, but, um, you need to come to the decision that makes the most sense for your company, for your culture, for the situation, for past practice, all those sorts of things need to go into the decision that you come to. Now, then you have to figure out what is the ultimate response. Just because it's sexual harassment doesn't mean that you necessarily have to fire the person. It could be just that maybe it's just a hand on the shoulder one time and you need to counsel the person. Hey, uh, buddy, that's kind of creepy. That's not what we're about. You know, go back to um, Donald Draper, Draper, 1950s, 60s, 1950s or 60s. Um, anyway, go back to the 1950s, go back to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, <laughs> probably 2010s. Um, go back, go back there. And, uh, you know, but that's not what we're about anymore. No more hands on shoulders. No more, no more leaning in um, to smell somebody's, you know, perfume. That's just not where – yeah, Don Draper, thank you. Um, and that's just not where we, where we are these days. That doesn't mean just because, you know, somebody put their hand on their shoulder, a uh, female shoulder, uh, subordinate shoulder one time, leaned in in a creepy manner to smell her perfume, commented – on her, you know, clothing, that doesn't mean you're going to necessarily fire the person. Now, maybe if it's like the third or fourth time, yeah, okay, you know, clearly the guy's not getting the, me the memo. But if it's just a one-off, it's probably a counseling. So whatever it is, you need, to, you need to determine what your response is and talk to their manager and figure it out. And, again, every response could be different. It could be training. It could be um, – uh, harassment training, it could be anti-discrimination training, it could be a suspension, it could be a write-up. It's going to be driven based on your company's culture, your, your um, past history with this employee, and then also, uh, you know, the severity and the nature of, of um, the actions themselves. Some ideas that I've already talked about uh, a little bit, but um, one thing that I would point out is uh, off-duty conduct. A lot of people think, like, just because it happens outside the workplace that it doesn't mean that the company can do anything about it, and that's complete hogwash. Um, you can, if somebody, like I said, my Friday night, they go on a date and the date goes badly, um, that has a direct impact on the workplace because they both work together. And so that harassment that occurred on Friday night outside work, that's now brought into the workplace on Monday. Therefore, the employer has the, has, has the obligation, really, to address it once they know about it. So it, once they know about it, once it's complained about it, it's a problem. And so you want to actually, you can still investigate and put a stop to it. Now, you, you, know, you might treat it differently if it's off-duty conduct versus um, on-duty conduct, but um, the point is you could still fire a person for off-duty conduct. We, companies fire people for what they do outside the workplace all, all the time, even if it's illegal, even if it's legal. Um, they, they sometimes do it because it has an impact on, because they bring that, you know, you could, for example, like people say dumb stuff on Twitter like every, I don't know, half a second of every day. Um, probably more frequently than that, dumb stuff is said on Twitter. Um, it's legal to say dumb stuff on Twitter, but that doesn't mean that you can't fire somebody for saying dumb stuff on, on Twitter, even though it's legal, right? It's the same, same with harassment. So, um, so we might, you know, just to, to bear in mind that um, – and then we also want, from a company culture and morale standpoint, we want to show that we do thorough, neutral, responsive investigations and that we take these things – we take these things um, seriously. And then here are some more tips that I would include. Um, again, beware of privacy issues. We don't want to disclose like who's making the allegations and what the exact allegations 
are, we want to take the person's confidentiality, of course, we're going to have to explain to, to witnesses, we, we're going to have to give them some context so that they understand. A lot of times they're probably are going to know what, what it's about. But um, we don't want to, you know, air all of the, the dirty laundry. And um, in the preparation for communications to employees and third parties, these are just some bullet points that I would, I would uh, recommend that you, you know, understand the legal liability, reiterate the policy and the culture that you need to have, and then um, it's really important for you to show strength in responding to it. And then here's just some stuff starting from scratch. Uh, I, didn't, I mentioned some of this already, but the only other thing I would mention, and then we're going to call it quits here, is you know you should be training your managers at least once a year. Some states even require it, like California, New York, um, even require that you train managers, and that and that's just the thing. So as a company, you're going to want to train managers on harassment, on understanding harassment procedures and and protocols and everything, and then you're going to want to train employees at probably every other year, and then also at onboarding. But you will want to do updated training for them. Uh, pretty frequently, and then just make sure from a company standpoint that you've got senior leadership buy-in. Um, if you know that if you don't have senior leadership buying in, buying into this, it's um, pretty hard to do these investigations and to have and to get any um, real you know movement on the culture toward uh, a less harassing, um, less discriminating um, type of workplace atmosphere. So, one hour's up. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, next month, we are going to talk about handbooks front to back. We're going to talk about key policies and uh, discretionary policies and just you know tips for doing, doing handbooks. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me at kmosier at thompsonco.com. You're also always welcome to call me um, uh, at uh, 651-389-5007. And if you have any questions about the MyHR Genius Program or um, any other services that we have, Feel free to um, free, feel free to reach out to me at any time or check out our website at myhrgenius.co. Hope everybody has a great month.